morning. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my niece. Her name is Clara. She lives in London, but she has 437 friends in South Africa, the US, um, I think a couple in Australia. This is just typical. She's 22. What else would you do? You Twitter. You tweet. She's doing that, whilst at the same time probably listening to iTunes. And if she's anything like um, the rest of the world, she's probably video gaming at the same time. This is a world for the young brain. You can't do this when you're my age, or at least not very well. But that's not the end of it. It's not just our brains that are sort of challenged at this point. It's the fact that our bodies are being hurtled all over the place by technology. How many of you recognize this particular scenario? Well, I hope not any of you, because I wouldn't like to be in the way of a 380, but the fact of the matter is most of us in the last week have probably been on a plane. Several of us are severely jet-lagged. And a lot of us are conducting um, seminars and or conference calls at 2 a.m., especially if you live in Australia. And may, the major problem in coping with all of this is that we're getting older and it gets harder and harder to do these things. So the big sort of debilitating elephant in the room is aging. Even if we are getting older by two years every so often, the fact of the matter is, are we getting better at dealing with these problems? So aging, of course, is a major problem because of the baby boomers who are coming through. And just in America alone, $430 billion is being spent on Medicare. And in the NIH, there's only 0.1% of all of the research funding going towards aging. That's about $10 million. doesn't sound like a very lot of money for the U.S. to be spending on a population that is soon going to be 170% more 80-year-olds. All right, so I'm interested in aging. I'm interested in what we can do about it. I'm interested in what it is, because unless we know what it is, we can't change anything. One of the things that happens in aging is that you get chronically ill much more often. So right away, that tells you that the demographics of people in hospitals is going to change as the aging community piles up to the right hand of that graph. So let's just look at what happens in a community. As you grow older, you get experience, hopefully wisdom. That's the blue sort of increasing triangle there. Your capacity, on the other hand, essentially peaks and then slowly goes down. Well, I mean, I'd like to think that we're not going to do that, but let's just say, in general, you can't do what you could do when you were 20. And you can't certainly multitask the way my 22-year-old niece, Clara, can do. Furthermore, by the time you're um, getting to the point where things are really serious, you're costing everyone a lot of money. So what's happening is the benefit of all that experience is being lost on the decrease in capacity, and it's actually costing us money to keep going. So there's that window of opportunity that you see there that is literally getting smaller and smaller as people get older but not better. Supposing instead that you could push this out so that you wouldn't necessarily increase lifespan, but you'd increase relative health span. And in order to do that, you would essentially be able to minimize the amount of money we're spending at the very end of our lives and increase that wonderful area where experience can work. It would change the workforce. It would actually change society. So we believe, therefore, that there is an important role for us scientists to do something about this. And there are three areas of intervention. The first is in taking out some of the environmental factors that contribute to old aid related disease, such as toxins, public health problems, lifestyle. The trouble with that is, is that it only works if you intervene very early. Now, assuming that, in fact, that is not necessarily going to happen, maybe we can change metabolism. We know from animal studies that restricting the amount you eat can have a rather extraordinary effect on your ability to live longer. So flies that are starved live longer, even mice that are starved live longer. I don't really see this as a great way to get old. I'd rather not starve. It's a question of whether it's worth living. So that maybe doesn't work, and furthermore, you have to start very early starving yourself for it to make any real difference. So what we really need to do is find a way to attract scientific interest to the damage itself that is created as we get older and then intervene in that damage directly. And that's what regenerative medicine is trying to do, and I'm going to tell you a little story about that. So what is regenerative medicine? Um, this is for Rowan in the audience that basically uh, asked me this question at a master class yesterday, and Rowan, this is for you. 
Um, he's recovering from wrist injuries, so he knows all about regeneration. It's repairing, replacing, restoring, and regenerating areas of damage and injury. Um, the problem is that we're not as good at doing it as some animals. So I'm intrigued by the fact that there are these little planaria that can, you can cut them up into a thousand pieces and each one of them can become a new planarian. Or I'm going to tell you a little story about those little newts in the middle. Um, and no matter how we work at the gym, and this is actually me without my clothes on, um, <laughs> it's really not going to help me when I get old because my muscle's going to deteriorate anyway. So big questions out there, wicked problems that we don't know how to solve. We all know that fish are very regenerative. You can cut out half their heart and it grows back. Take their fin off, it grows back. This little guy down below is a salamander, and my postdoc cut off his arm. I'll tell you why that's not a horrible thing, because actually he can grow it right back again. So why have we lost regenerative capacity? Is it because we have profit to gain from some evolutionary change in, in, our, in our makeup? Is it possible that we get less cancer because we can regenerate less well? Maybe we just have other compromised aspects of our life, which um, would, you know, would not be uh, possible if we didn't age. Or perhaps we're just evolutionary losers. And if that's the case, which is my favorite possibility, we can gain it back. Maybe there are ways in which we can find the magic trick that the fish know and the salamanders know. So one thing we do know is that we can regenerate when we're in the embryonic state. But after we get born, we slowly lose that capacity. Well, not so slowly, rather rapidly. We also know that many other things happen when we get born. Among other things, our stem cells actually start to decrease. There aren't as many of them in the body. I'm going to tell you a little about stem cells, because someone asked me, what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that can do this. It can divide, or it can divide in a way that can either produce two identical daughters or an identical daughter and another daughter that can do something else. And in order to make an embryo, you have to have cells that can do something else, otherwise you just get a big ball of stem cells. So that's where all the other colors come in. And by the time you're an adult, you have very few of these left. You have some, and in fact, in some organs of your body, you have quite a few, like your skin. But for the most part, you don't have that many left. And they can replenish themselves basically by reproducing themselves or by becoming other tissues. So we'd like to know how is it possible that we could maybe activate stem cells in some way. So we look at the whole problem of regeneration from a more balanced point of view, not just stem cells and not just the degenerative disease, but how this balance is, is actually achieved. So scarring is the major problem when you get injured. It can actually keep you from regenerating. We know this from all sorts of experiments. We know that repair involves replacement of cells. We don't know how to shift that balance over. Now, I'm going to introduce you to my favorite new organism. It's called an axolotl. It's a salamander. It's an aquatic salamander. And it doesn't scar when you cut off its uh, tail, its limbs, whatever. It's an amazingly regenerative animal. It looks really cute, and it has plenty of immune cells in it that look just like ours. And we suspect that this scarring, which is actually a, a, a product of immune response, might actually be because the animal doesn't have the same immune system. Well, it, that's not true. It has exactly the same immune system. And um, that makes it very cute, but it is also a vicious cannibal. And what it does is it walks over to its fellow axolotl when stressed, hungry, or otherwise in a bad mood and eats its ends off. And we can do this in the lab and follow how this thing grows back, this incredible limb regenerates perfectly. Even the pattern on the skin is exactly the same. So we did it in the, in the, in the lab with the proper, proper anesthesia and um, reassuring uh, comments about how it was going to grow its limb back and you shouldn't worry. And we did it either with all the immune cells intact or we took one immune cell out, one kind of immune cell called a macrophage, and we asked now, can the animal do the same thing? And the answer is no. It made a great big scar. It looked like an amputee. And we were really excited because now we had actually interfered with a, uh, a process which these animals do on a daily basis. I mean, this axolotl was totally surprised. It was wandering around for about three months without its arm, going, what is going on? Where's my arm? So he said, let's fix it. So I suggested to my postdoc that we cut it off again. I'm a real sadist. And what happened was amazing. Because we hadn't fiddled with the immune system and it had regrown by this time, the animal grew the arm back. So the pattern is there. And this animal has everything we have. It has a heart, it has a brain, it has an immune system, and it has a pancreas. It's not that different from us. So is it possible that we could actually do this with us? And if so, this wouldn't ever happen, and we wouldn't have a Paralympics. It would be amazing. And of course, that's the future, and I'd love to say I know how that's going to happen, but it's a big ask. So what can we do in the meantime? What we can do is look at 
organs that are very, very susceptible to age-related diseases. And specifically, I work on the heart. I'm going to show you one vignette in the heart. And here we have a picture of a heart after a heart attack. What happens is the blood gets stuck in your body um, against some sort of a block in your, in your artery. The tissue that normally gets blood and oxygen underneath that, that's served by that artery, starts to die. Then the heart is compromised because it's a great big pump and it needs every bit of it. And now you can't actually pump right, and the heart gets all deformed, and pretty soon it starts to fall apart. And the reason for this is because it can't regenerate the new tissue. If you do this to a fish, no problem. If you do it to an axolotl, no problem. So can we regenerate the heart tissue? And you heard a little vignette this morning about how this might be possible with stem cells, and you'll hear more from Sylvia, I hope, about this. But the issue is mainly that we've got to find a way around that scarring. So we, we played a little game in the lab where we actually added a growth factor using genetic tricks to a mouse, which has absolutely the same problem we do when it gets a heart attack. It can't regenerate. And this is the only data I'm going to show you, but it's primary data out of my lab. What you see at the top is an animal that has had a heart attack about, a, excuse me, about 30 days afterwards, and the heart is edemic, it's big, it's floppy, and you can see this hideous scar, which is the blue stuff on the... That's the ventricular wall. That's what's supposed to be pumping. There's nothing left. Well, if you do the same thing in an animal that has this factor called IGF-1, miraculously, the animal starts to heal, just as if it were an axolotl. And in fact, what we've now discovered is that that IGF-1 is attracting the good immune cells that we took out of the axolotl that made all the difference. So now we have an intervention in a mammal that we might be able to apply to a human and reduce that scar to something that will literally just eventually go away, just like a scab falls off the healing skin. So can you take this to the clinic? Well, I don't know. We're trying. So one of the possibilities is that you can add to cell therapy, which is um, the, the stem cell goal, add new cells, have them do something important when they get there, some sort of a growth factor therapy on top of that, using one of these growth factors like the one I just told you about. And maybe if you actually combine these and figure out exactly how it works in the axolotl or in the fish, you could, in fact, create a situation in a scenario where we might be able to intervene early in these debilitating diseases and have an effect. So what's next? Well, first of all, we don't know if the immune system ages. Maybe it does, and maybe that's the problem. Maybe we get older in our immunity, and so we start messing things up as we get older, and that's why we're more susceptible to these age-related diseases. So we're looking into that. Maybe we can actually regenerate our immune system even if it does get old. And that might be something we might be able to do. It's a much more tractable possibility because we actually know a lot about the immune system and we've been treating people with immune disorders for a very long time. And then finally, it might be that the stem cell therapy and the immune system have to go together. And that's the new idea that we're really trying to push, is to put these two things together. But ultimately, we're down to looking at how nature does it. And I would just like to leave you with this picture, which is... A, an apologies to Michelangelo. I lived in Rome for a long time. I looked at the Sistine Chapel a lot, and I thought, I better get more animals into that guy than Michelangelo did. And the idea is, is that within us, we have the entire evolution of the mammalian species, which went right back to vertebrates and beyond, and many of these organisms can regenerate much better than we can. So perhaps borrowing from nature is the best solution to this particular wicked problem. Thank you. Thank you.